Wow, look at them go. Oh, hey there. I'm just hanging out here watching these salmon make their way upstream to spawn, die, and start the cycle of life all over again. They sure are remarkable little beauties, aren't they? And as a foundational species, their health is crucial to the health and function of ecosystems all throughout our bioregion, from the oceans to these rivers to the forests that surround us. We tend to take nature's little miracles like this for granted, but it's important that we remember just how fragile it all really is and that it hasn't always been this way. Over the past hundred years or so, us humans have done some pretty silly things that ended up damaging these very rivers that these salmon need to survive, putting them at risk of going extinct. And if they do, these ecosystems that all depend on them that we live in will collapse. See, as humans, our actions are always coming from a place limited by the knowledge that we have at any current moment in time, and we're always in the process of learning from our mistakes in order to do better. Redfish Restoration Society is a nonprofit organization based on the west coast of Vancouver Island that strives for wild fish conservation through habitat restoration, research, and monitoring using science, knowledge, and technology of today in order to undo the damage done in the past. Since water flows downhill, in order to repair these damaged river ecosystems, we need to start at the source, way up there in those mountains. So come on, let's go check it out. Wow, an ancient old growth forest ecosystem. Pretty spectacular, huh? I mean, ecosystems like this just host so much biodiversity from not only the different critters that live here to the different plant and tree species, but diversity of ages as well with ancient matriarch western red cedars like this beauty here that provide shelter, shade, and nutrients to other saplings in the understory, as well as a mix of different amabilis firs, western hemlocks, douglas firs, and sicca spruce. From the lichen and the mosses way up there in the canopy to the rich layer of topsoil here in the understory, these forest ecosystems act as giant sponges, absorbing and filtering water from the atmosphere and rainfall, and in regulating its flow as it finds its way down these hills and mountains to the rivers and streams below. Wow. When these forests were initially logged about half a century ago, many were done in a method of clear cutting quite similar to this without the greatest foresight into the impact it would have on the broader landscape. With all that biodiversity literally leveled to the ground, all these dead roots and upturned soils are going to be exposed to the elements, which is going to lead to a faster rate of topsoil erosion, leading to faster water runoff carrying heavier sediments, and rapidly fluctuating water levels and muddying up of rivers downstream. In these early days of logging, clear cuts were never replanted, they were left to regenerate naturally, which often led to monocultures of trees like western hemlocks, which quickly took advantage of these open areas and when replanting efforts did begin it was often done with Douglas fir trees as Douglas fir trees are the most profitable trees to plant but Douglas fir trees aren't necessarily ecologically appropriate to these coastal environments so in either case you end up with either an unnatural or a non-native monoculture of trees that greatly reduces the biodiversity here. In order to rehabilitate these damaged forest ecosystems, we need to restore the biodiversity of native species at different ages, which is going to allow for all of this to flourish here. Restoration here often involves thinning out these monocultures to create standing dead snags, coarse woody debris and fallen logs, and gaps in the canopy that allows for sunlight to come into the understory so that saplings here can survive. Here, western red cedar, amabilis fir, and sicca spruce trees are planted to increase species richness, which also allows for other species to take root like this red huckleberry here. By breaking up these monocultures, we can create a multi-layered canopy that allows for all this diversity to exist here, ultimately creating a more heterogeneous structure to the forest. Here on these rugged Cascadian coastlines of deep fjords and some of the highest levels of precipitation seen anywhere on earth, our forests play a critical role in holding everything together, literally. You see, most of the soils around here are relatively shallow, resting on bedrock or basal tills, and landslides can occur when excessive water gets into those soils and reduces the friction between the soil layer and the bedrock below, causing it to collapse. But on hillsides like this one here, the rich diversity of tree species and vegetation helps hold all the soils and humus together during heavy rains and strong winds when landslides occur the most often often. Back in the day, many logging roads were constructed on really steep slopes without a lot of thought put into their stability, and pre-code forestry and road building are estimated to have increased debris flow and landslides 25 to 300 times that of an unlogged watershed, which is absolutely nuts. Whatever the cause may be, whether it's water that's been diverted into a ditch that disrupts the drainage patterns, cut and fill techniques that cause over steepened slopes to collapse, or cut slope failures where slopes above roadways collapse, a small slide here can quickly escalate to be more than a kilometer wide, spreading all the way down to the river valley bottom below. When this material and debris enters the rivers and streams below, it can quickly overrun the channel destroying all fish habitat. Landslides and slope flares are not one-time events, and they continue to bleed sediment with every rain cycle, filling up tributaries and rivers below with coarse and fine rocks and debris. Restoration in these areas often includes bioengineered modified brush layers, tree planting, willow staking, and grass seeding, which all helps to accelerate the natural rehabilitation of these areas. 
Modified brush layers are essentially steps cut into steep slopes using 2x6s, rebar, and willow stakes, which not only reduces the angle of the slope, but provides flat areas for vegetation to root and grow on. To prevent future landslides, vast tracts of logging roads need to be deactivated, rerouting water from ditches to restore natural drainage properties. The logging roads also need to be recontoured with oversteepened edges removed and large woody debris reintroduced to replicate logs and downed trees that would have existed prior to logging. And then finally, these hillsides are replanted with trees to aid in forest succession as trees intercept vast amounts of water through uptake, transpiration, and evaporation, thus reducing surface area flows, while the roots work to stabilize the soil and prevent future landslides. Oh, what a cute little salmon fry. How gorgeous is this little stream in an old growth forest, right? So picturesque, like something straight out of Fern Gully. Well, not only does the health of this stream depend on the forest surrounding it, but this stream actually contributes to the health of the forest. You see these gently sloping, cool shaded waters carved through soft soils to create a twisting, arcing stream around coarse woody debris that creates deep pools and, and cool water that salmon love to thrive and swim and play in. And when they die, their carcasses are carried far off into the woods by bears and other scavengers where they decompose, returning oceanic nitrogen to the soils so that cedars like this can continue to grow big and strong and shade and cool the waters. It's all part of a cycle. Unfortunately, many roads and highways were constructed at a time when people didn't really think about fish or their habitat. As a result, many culverts are too small, creating a fire hose effect with water velocity that physically impedes the fish from migrating, and many are too long, spanning multiple lanes of highway with no features or any resting spots for fish along the way. Additionally, corrugated metal is no substitute for a healthy stream bed, and the angle of the culvert can have a huge role to play on the water velocity as well. When the outlet of a culvert is hung, sometimes the height of the jump can exceed the physical capacity of the fish, like this one here. This is over two meters high. There is no fish in the entire world that can make this jump. Improperly designed or installed culverts like this one here can eventually lead to habitat fragmentation, essentially isolating populations of salmon from their spawning grounds, not to mention that salmon aren't the only critters that use culverts, so reconnecting the watershed has massive health implications for the entire ecosystem. So how did the fish cross the road? Well, it didn't. A hung, steep, collapsed, or undersized culvert essentially blocks fish travel, so out with the old and in with the new. A functioning culvert maintains natural flow regimes, allowing for the year-round passage of adult and juvenile fish by protecting the existing conditions of the stream. They should be large enough to handle the river at maximum flow, allowing for the transport of nutrients, sediments, woody debris, and fish passage. A properly designed culvert is short, low gradient, open bottomed or embedded with natural substrates, and backwater, raising the overall water levels within the culvert and creating a natural stream channel like this one here. Here we are in a healthy riparian forest right alongside a river. And in case you couldn't tell, we've got all sorts of diversity all over the place from a multi-layered canopy with these towering western red cedars and sicca spruces to big leaf maple trees and a diverse understory of a variety of different fern species, salmonberry, mosses on the forest floor, and even cute little lurkish ferns like this. Now all these different species here work together to create a rich mesh or web of roots in the soil that holds it together during rains or flooding, preventing it from being eroded. And this really diverse understory here acts as a sponge, soaking up water and regulating its flow as it finds its way down to the streams below. Pretty gorgeous, isn't it? In this damaged riparian area, you can see that the clear cut extended all the way down to the banks of the river. And instead of a healthy, diverse forest ecosystem with a variety of different species, a rich root network, and a multi-layered canopy, we now have a young forest with a single canopy and very little understory. This dense canopy is going to shade out the naturally regenerating native conifers of cedar and spruce, which already have a rough go of it during the winter months when they're foraged heavily by deer, ultimately slowing down the natural regeneration of this disturbance area. The lack of big trees and rich vegetation, which would absorb and control the rate of water runoff here, is going to create a much more flashy river system in this damaged floodplain, resulting in higher fluctuating water levels, and the lack of roots in the soil is going to lead to an increase in erosion and siltration downstream. To assist in the succession of these disturbed areas and help create a functioning floodplain, there are a couple different things we can do. For starters, thinning out these deciduous trees here is going to open up canopy gaps, which is going to let more light come down to the forest floor, creating a healthy, diverse understory, as well as providing light to those little sapling conifers. We can then use willow stakes to reinforce the riverbanks, which are going to sprout new shoots and roots in the springtime, and those roots are all going to bind that soil together, creating firm ground that allows for other plant species and conifers to take roots. Additionally, planting more mature conifer trees that are more resistant to deer foraging also helps and all of this works towards creating a healthy riparian forest area with healthy waterways downstream. Hoo-wee! 
get a load of this gorgeous little river bend here, huh? It's so picturesque with these big old growth trees, rich vegetation on the stream banks, and clean, clear water running over a healthy stream bed of different gravel and river rocks makes not only a perfect ecosystem for humans like us to gawk at, but for salmon to migrate through. See the clean, crisp, cool waters here allow for salmon to swim through them effortlessly, and the variety of material on the river bottom, as well as different obstacles, helps create pools and eddies and resting spots as they migrate their way upstream. It also creates riffles at the crest of pools where female salmon will lay their eggs into the gravel to be fertilized by the milt of a male salmon and they'll stay in there all winter long emerging in the spring as healthy little salmon fry. It's pretty incredible. Yet here, as is often the case in rivers downstream of industry and development, the riverbed's been totally inundated with gravel and sediment. Sand, silt, and gravel has been transported from landslides and slope failures upstream and deposited here totally overwhelming the channel. What once was narrow and deep is now shallow, wide, and relatively featureless with the exception of these two major gravel bars here which are easily mobile during high flows and can easily smother reds choking them out of the dissolved oxygen that they need to survive. Whoa, check out all these willow stakes here. Just a couple centimeters above the gravel during high flow times, it adds enough surface roughness to the water to slow it down and allow for leaf litter and a lock thinness material to drop out of the water column and deposit here. I mean, this is the beginning of a forest floor. Next spring, all these willow stakes are gonna have new shoots and new roots going deep into the soils here, holding it all together and allowing for more debris to collect. When in just a couple years, this whole gravel bar is gonna be covered with willow, red alder, salmonberry, and thimbleberry. And then after that, we're gonna have a couple, you know, sick of spruce trees that'll be able to germinate in the understory and before long, we'll have a healthy riparian coniferous forest that holds all this soil together, which means that our salmon reds in the river over there are safe. Now this process would normally happen over time, but by willow staking and tree planting, we're able to speed it up by hundreds of years. And check it out, you can see it working here. Wow! Wow! Check out this healthy flowing river ecosystem. You might not know it, but all these down logs and woody debris is actually a good thing. See, this variety of wood helps break up and slow the water currents, creating deep pools and riffles of cool water havens that salmon love, rich in nutrients, which makes perfect spawning grounds as well as habitat for juvenile salmon to thrive. Additionally, bigger fallen logs like that western red cedar there help stabilize the riverbanks, holding rocks and large gravel pieces in place, while all these smaller sticks and branches keep sediments and aloctonous material from being swept away. And it all contributes to a healthy river ecosystem that salmon and other critters around here absolutely love. To facilitate logging operations and maintain infrastructure such as bridges, many woody debris jams were removed from rivers at the onset of logging, but without old growth trees, down logs, and these woody debris jams to regulate and slow the flow of the river, the river quickly unravels. This unobstructed flow creates erosion on either side of the channel, which creates a wide, shallow river which heats up in the summer months, exposing juvenile salmon to lethal water temperatures. The lack of woody debris means that there's no pools or overhangs or places for salmon to hide from predators like bears who do incredibly well at hunting in featureless streams like this. And even if the salmon and do survive the bears, an unobstructed flow like this is no place to build a nest as reds are easily swept away when there's no wood present. So to rehabilitate a damaged, featureless river, we first start by planting trees on the banks, which is going to stabilize those soils and prevent further erosion. We can then reintroduce woody debris in the form of log jams back into the river from either salvaged logs from nearby or brought in from elsewhere. Now log jams like this help the river form pools and eddies as the water bends and molds around these new obstructions, creating hiding spots, deep pools, cool waters that salmon absolutely love. Everything in this world is always changing and evolving. In fact, change is the only constant in life. We may not be able to change the fact that many of these ecosystems were damaged in the past, but we can take what we've learned and act in a way today to ensure their health for the survival of not only the salmon, but everything else that depends on them, to the bears, these trees, and even humans like us. Because after all, we're not apart from nature, we're a part of it.